yourselves and uh, and Mon Barlow tonight. She's at the end of uh, a BC tour. She's done what eight talks in five days, and it sounds like there's uh, just been this similar kind of uh, response and interest uh, around uh, Canadian sovereignty issues, free trade. Um, uh, it felt particularly, it struck me particularly timely this weekend that we were gathering to do a talk and, and kind of. Uh, a discussion around uh, uh, Canadian economic social issues. There was a release on my doorstep this weekend of the uh, uh, federal government's uh, kind of a glossy uh, a little ad on free trade, um, um, uh, sort of speaking to uh, all of its benefits for all the people. And there was also the uh, breaking of, uh, I think of McLean's, of, uh, may, may speak to this, of the, the NAFTA tapes. Uh, so, certainly the issues of uh, free trade are coming under a lot more critical scrutiny nowadays. Uh, economic issues and how we define them are coming under a lot of scrutiny. And I'm, I'm just really pleased that Maude kind of uh, squeezed Nelson into her schedule when uh, it was made known uh, to him, to her, that uh, we were interested in having her visit. Uh, I should let folks know that uh, uh, you know, Maude is chair of the Council of Canadians, uh, a group very dedicated to uh, um, sovereignty issues and uh, uh, economic independence. Uh, that she functions uh, and does her work uh, quite tirelessly, it seems, as, uh, as a volunteer, uh, as not paid staff, as well as with some of her colleagues, and Michael Clark also functions uh, through the Action Canada Network uh, in volunteer capacity. So uh, uh, I think uh, those of us here in the Central America group and, and CUSO who organize this have really appreciate her uh, coming uh, somewhat out of her way to, to speak and, and hopefully galvanizing uh, it seems like the public's ready to be galvanized on these issues. So uh, there will be a little coffee, and if people at, at the end of the talk want to stay and chat, you'd be very uh, welcome to. Uh, we really appreciate the donation monies, and we will be covering some of the costs from this evening and, and, and making a donation to Council of Canadians. Uh, people interested in that group, I think Maude will be speaking to uh, uh, those issues. So without further ado, uh, in my Thank you very much. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be here, and I'm very impressed with the turnout. I mean, this is really something. It makes it fully worthwhile to have taken that drive today, which actually was a beautiful drive, but a long one, so I'm just thrilled to be here. I've been uh, crisscrossing this country for the last couple of years, last long five years now, I guess, talking to Canadians about uh, the economy and our country and our future. And I came across something I thought you'd get a kick out of. This was a, uh, a writer, an activist on the prairies during the 1930s was writing about how Canada differs, differs politically from region to region. And this was 60 years ago he said this, and I, it just strikes me funny, particularly with BC. He said, in Atlantic Canada, politics is a way of life. He said, in Quebec, it's a religion. He said, in Ontario, it's a business. And let me tell you, <laughs> for Bob Ray. He said, on the prairies, it's a cause. And he said, in British Columbia, it's entertainment. <laughs> One week say we're all going to vote yes for the Constitution. Now it looks like we're going to vote no for the Constitution. I uh, and people are mad. I was in uh, Regina not long ago. I was on a, an open line talk show through all of Saskatchewan. It's an hour long. People call in, and they told me it's one of the most listened, or it is the most listened to talk show in, in, in Saskatchewan. It has a huge audience. So we got talking about, of course, free trade and NAFTA and all my concerns. And people started phoning in, bashing Brian Mulroney, which is everybody's favorite sport. I wasn't doing it, I, but they were. Anyway, the lines all went, went just crazy. A chance to bash Mulroney, everybody got on the lines, right? So this guy finally said, ladies and gentlemen, is there anybody out there who likes Brian Mulroney? There must be. 
He said, now you're going to have a hard time getting through because the lights were all crazy. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to reserve one line for people who like Moroni. So this is your line. He read out the number. And he said, now don't phone if, if you don't like Moroni, right? So it became a bit of a joke when anybody called. Nobody was calling on the Moroni line. But halfway through, the Moroni line goes. He said, great. You're on the air, ma'am. Do you like Brian Moroni? She said, yes, I do. I think he's a lovely boy. And I hit my barrel. I think she's communist. I'm going to come down and hit her. <laughs> she said she was sorry there was no tarring and feathering anymore. That they, she came out of the out of the province. Anyway, so he hung up, and we kind of laughed. And I said, gee, I haven't felt so welcome since uh, Harvey Andre called me Canada's answer to Nikolai Ceausescu. <laughs> 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 Right? Oh, the Toronto Sun called me Canada's Eva Perona. I'm trying to figure out where I am in the political spectrum here. Right? Anyway, uh, so we laughed about it and we waited and he kept saying, is there anybody else out there? The Moroni line stayed quiet. The last 10 seconds, the Moroni line lit up and he said, great, you're on the air, sir. Do you like Brian Moroni? He said, no, I hate the son of a bitch, but I couldn't get through and I wanted to see that. <laughs> Well, what am I here to talk about? I'm here to talk about free trade, NAFTA. I'm going to talk at you for a little while and then open it up and hope to have a conversation with you about it, answer questions and hear your thoughts. I guess what I want to try to say to you tonight as strongly as I can is that while Canada has been having this passionate and public and painful debate about our constitution, which is the political way we work, we have, Canada has been negotiating with the United States and Mexico to arrange what I call an economic constitution on our continent, which I believe is every bit as important as the political constitution. In fact, I would argue is going to have a more important effect on our future than anything we're doing Senate-wise. <laughs> uh, so I want, I want to shine some light on that tonight. It's uh, quite wonderful and ironic that the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, was finalized at the famous Watergate Hotel in uh, Washington. And the tape that I'm going to tell you about a few minutes ago, it's a, it's a, it was a leaked tape of a, a conference call by senior uh, Tory aides on how to deal with us, how to discredit us. They're calling them the NAFTA tapes after <laughs> the, whole, the whole secrecy business at the Watergate. But it has been happening in so much secrecy that when we and our American counterparts and our Mexican counterparts followed the ministers around from different cities and different countries over the last two years, we would, when they had their negotiations, they would hold a big press conference with the press from the three countries. We would be kicked out. We wouldn't even be allowed to sit and listen as representatives of environmental groups and people's movements and social groups and labor groups and seniors and teachers and so on. We wouldn't be allowed to sit in the room. It has been that kind of control. So I want to see if we can shine some light on it tonight because I think you have been kept in the dark deliberately and I think we need to, to, have to talk about it. Now what we do know is that from the polls, most Canadians think the free trade agreement has failed. However, what the polls also tell us is that we're not sure what to do about it. So we're, at a, we're, we're confused about whether we should abrogate it or keep it and try to change it. And actually the polls often say to people, you know, so you don't like it, would you change it or scrap it? And given the option, Canadians being nice, thoughtful people say, oh, well, if it's changeable, I guess we should change it. Well, I don't think it is. And that's what I'm going to try to convince you of tonight. So this BC trip is the first part of a campaign by Tony Clark and myself. I'll tell you about our organizations in a few minutes to launch a campaign to talk to Canadians about the next stage of this free trade uh, expansion. Now, it really does come in stages. This is Stage one was the Canada-US free trade agreement. Stage two is adding Mexico, it's called NAFTA. Stage three is the addition of all the other countries of Central and South America. And the dream, which originated with George Bush and Ronald Reagan and the business community in the United States originally, is to have one free trade zone from the north of Canada to the very southern tip of South America. And what you should know about the NAFTA agreement is that they're talking about, they've got what's called an accession clause, which means that once NAFTA has been passed by the three countries, they can lock into 
uh, the, the agreement, any other country from Central and South America that wants to commit without going back to the legislatures. So once this is done, Chile is the next, and it's coming in very quickly. We won't have to go back and re-debate it. So when NAFTA is passed, we've actually passed uh, uh, hemispheric free trade. So it's not just the continent. It's really important for me to, to, to say that to you. Now, unlike Europe, which I think, although it has some problems, is designed to, to, I would argue, to better the community. What we're doing in North America is building a trade system with no standards. Uh, the United States wants to reassert its economic power in the, in the world, and it's, it's coming up against an emerging Europe and an emerging uh, Japan and, and Asian blocs. And so it's saying, well, we need to compete. And what they want is a free trade zone that uses Canada's uh, resources, our forests, our water, our natural gas, etc. American technology, money, and leadership, and the cheap labor of Mexico and Guatemala and the other countries, so Central and South America. And they are building a model with no standards. In Europe, when a country gives up some political power, it gives it over to the European community, which then sets standards for the whole. They have a social charter, they have an environmental charter, they have transfer payments to the poor to the poorer countries the way we have transfer payments in Canada. They have money put aside for workers displaced from the, the new trade arrangement so that they can be um, retrained and so on. The desire, the stated goal is to bring the standard of the community up to the higher levels of, of all. That is exactly the opposite of the kind of agreement that we're bringing into effect in this in this uh, continent. Now, I want to talk to you also about who controls this, because it's not just dominated by the United States, this trade block we're looking at. And it's important to remember that the United States is, has a larger economy by far than the other 34 countries of the Americas combined. So without an arrangement in which the United States would say, we'll give up some of our power in this new arrangement, it's, I think it's pretty clear we'll dominate it. But it's also going to be dominated by corporate interests. We've long been calling the Free Trade Agreement a corporate bill of rights or a corporate charter of rights and freedoms. And I'm going to try to explain to you why we say that. The United Nations tracks transnational corporations and says there are now about 600 in the world. They do between 80 and 90% of all the industrialized world's trade. And they own about 80% of all of the world uh, land that's cultivated for export-oriented crops. But they're gobbling each other up. And the United Nations says that within about 10 years, there will probably be fewer than 200 of them. So they eat up not only domestic industry, but each other. Now, what's the difference between a transnational and a multinational is that a transnational has no uh, national allegiance anymore. It may have an administrative head office in the country it started in, but it has production scattered through the third world. It has its research and development in a number of countries, has tax shelters in others. And it has disassociated itself from national purpose. And what free trade does is it gives the green light to companies to say, goodbye, we've nurtured you like Northern Telecom. We've given you just generations of taxpayers money to help you become who you are. Now with our blessing, you, your nas our national interest is not connected to yours. We have disassociated, we have delinked the purpose of business to any kind of purpose of, of giving back to the citizens of a country. Transnational corporations are like countries, only without a geographical boundary. They are uh, economically sovereign nations. I'll give you the most startling statistic of the evening. This is also a United Nations statistic. Of the, the world's 100 largest economies, 47 are now transnational corporations. That means that there are about 138 countries in the world that are smaller, have smaller economies, in some cases substantially smaller, than the Cargills and the at and and the Mitsubishis and the, and the, the American Express and so on. The, their money can flow electronically. They do not have to recognize democratically elected governments or nation states, the borders of nation states. But they talk lovingly of, of a world without borders. I am in, in a debate with my friend John Crispo <clears throat> once, you know, the John Crispo who called the CBC a slag heap, so they immediately made him a, a, a director. <laughs> That's what you get in, in Tory land. Uh, well, he, he quoted, we were, we were doing a debate, he quoted John Lennon, wouldn't it be nice to have a world without borders and without religions and so on. 
But I pointed out that it's not quite the corporate model that we're talking about. And these companies are seeking unrestricted trade, and they, they see standards as their enemies, and in fact, standards are their enemies. They, they, um, they are, are not democratically controlled, and I think it's very much an issue of democracy, because their power comes from the top down, not the bottom up. And it's interesting, as we see the demise of the centrally controlled countries of Eastern Europe, these, com com these companies, which are so totally centrally controlled, are growing up calling themselves another model. But in fact, there are a lot of interesting things we should be looking at in terms of similarities. So they, they not only do not respect the power of the nation state, but their power supersedes the power of the nation states of the world. And therefore, their power is, in my belief, a direct contradiction of democracy itself. <clears throat> now, of course, they, they uh, are then able to say, well, we're going to play off workers in one country against workers in another. We're going to be able to play the environment off in this country because it has lower standards or may have good standards, but it ignores them. And so what happens, of course, is that social programs and people and the environment become pawns in a global game of corporate chess. In North America, they're seeking unfettered access to the wealth, culture, resources, and human productivity of our hemisphere by creating this enormous free trade zone in which there are no minimum standards set. And they're trying to harmonize our system, and I believe our government's very willingly going along with this, <clears throat> because George Bush is who Brian Maloney wants to be when he grows up. <laughs> They're seeking to harmonize our system to the U.S. with its weakest to the wall, survival of the fittest economic uh, philosophy. And uh, a term that I've heard that I think describes it the best is that we've entered a, we've accepted a form of competitiveness that's a race to the bottom. Who can get there first so that you can attract transnational money? Competitive poverty is another term that I think <laughs> well suits it. What is it meant here? I'm just briefly going to talk about quickly five things that have happened in this country. I could talk all night about about 100, <laughs> but I won't. <clears throat> I'll just pick the ones that have, are sort of the first ones that are bothering me. The first is that free trade has, is creating a restructured job uh, situation in Canada. Not only have we lost a quarter of our manufacturing sector in just three years, and nobody's disputing that. The government's not disputing our numbers. They're saying you can't prove it's free trade related. But we are restructuring so that we're losing our good jobs. We're losing the high paid, full time manufacturing jobs. And all that's being created in this country are low paying, part time service sector jobs. And those get included in the employment figures. So where our unemployment is officially near, just near 12% now, uh, we believe it's much closer to 20, and some people even say that it's up to as high as 25, that are either unemployed or seriously underemployed. So we are shifting, we're going through a dramatic restructuring. When Michael Wilson says this is just a recessionary job loss, like the 1981-82 recession, he's wrong. Uh, Ontario studies show that the jobs that have gone this time have gone for good because the companies have actually physically moved away. When he says it's just a recession like the United States, he's wrong there too. What happened is that we've taken the Bureau of Census Statistics in the United States, and yes, they've experienced serious job loss in this recession. They've experienced one, on average, one quarter of the manufacturing job losses that we've experienced. So we argue that free trade has been the, 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 not the sole but probably the most important factor in, in this dramatic job loss. And I see absolutely no sign that this is going to abate. Certainly as NAFTA comes on stream and we have the Maquiladoras to move to. So that's the first. The second is resources. Under the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, we signed a proportional sharing clause for our energy, which includes oil, natural gas, hydroelectricity, and water. So that in perpetuity, the, the resources that belong to Canada, or that exist here in Canada, energy resources, now are continentally controlled. We have no right to say those are our resources for our use. We signed something that's called a national treatment agreement under the free trade agreement, which means we have to treat American companies as if they're Canadian. We can make no distinction. So we fought at the Council of Canadians, for instance, the, 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 the hearings for exports of the biggest natural gas mine that's ever been found in this country, the Mackenzie Valley. 
uh, they, it was three transnational companies uh, were, were vying for this, and they were given the right that the gas hasn't even brought out of the, out of the ground yet. They were given the right for 90% of this gas, once it's come on stream, guaranteed for export to the United States at long-term cheap uh, rates. <laughs> the rates really basically said at the time of the hearings. In fact, we well, before the free trade agreement, when, when the Energy Board heard applications for export, it had to, it had to ass assess whether there was a 25-year supply of that energy source for Canadians before granting export. That was wiped out with the free trade agreement. So what the National Energy Board said was, okay, we'll ma maintain a little mild policy where we can say, is this export in the net benefit of Canada? And they did that in four fairly minor cases of export application by Americans for some natural gas. The Americans went crazy. Canadian Petroleum Association went crazy because they're mostly dominated by <coughs> U.S. interests anyway. And they said, uh, you can't do that. You cannot treat us as if we're not Canadians. These are not exports. Understand, this energy doesn't belong to you anymore. And Canada capitulated. So they moved the National Energy Board from Ottawa to Calgary to make Alberta feel better. They should have moved it to Washington, because that's who it serves. And of course, I don't have to tell you about a very edgy uh, issue around here, and that's our forests. As you probably know, because you live in this system, we're cutting down our forests at a rate of uh, an acre every five seconds, but increasingly it's to, to foreign-dominated industries. <laughs> our latest statistics are that just under 70% of our forest industry is now controlled by, uh, uh, by non-Canadian industry. So of course, what this is going to do in terms of our environment, I think, is very serious. You can't deregulate trade and resources and say that, that it's between the corporate buyer and the corporate seller, and then put environmental standards on. Now, those are incompatible statements, you know, those are incompatible practices. And you should know under free trade, we have to harmonize things like food safety standards, pesticide use, and so on. We're harmonizing our pesticide standards to take into effect a commercial test that the Americans use, which we have not previously allowed. So, you know, this is all quietly going on in these little committees that sit and talk about standardization and so on. So that's my second concern. My third is our foreign policy. Where you were in the Gulf War is not the issue here. <clears throat> Although I, I was not happy with it and not happy with our stand, but that's not the issue that I want to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you about is how we made the decision to go to war. George Bush wanted Canada on its arm like a nice bride to go down to the UN and say, Canada's with us and we want the United Nations to agree to this war. He brought Brian Mulroney down in his boat off Kennebunkport, Port Maine, took him out in the ocean and fished and stuck a hook through his nose. Oh no, it was Mulroney who did it through, through bushes anyway. Uh, they were fishing big fish. And said, I want you to activate the Canadian Navy. And Brian Mulroney activated the Canadian Navy without going to his own cabinet. Several months later, when the bombs had started dropping and the Canadian Navy was sailing, our parliament debated whether we should be having, whether we should be taking part in the war or not. Now, I don't know how you describe political sovereignty, but to me that's not political sovereignty. We've been, <coughs> excuse me, monitoring the integration of our defense production systems between Canada and the United States. And I came into a uh, possession of a 1987 leaked external affairs document that talked openly about where, where uh, defense production was concerned, doing away with the borders, just absolutely doing away. Sharing not only our planning and, the, re and the, the, the procurement and so on, government procurement between the two countries, but the deployment of these systems as well. Now it's real hard to have your industry totally immersed in the American military industry, for which we build component parts, we don't have the systems themselves, and then turn around and have an independent foreign policy. It's very difficult. And I want you to know that under the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, there were only two areas permitted for subsidy. Only two areas in which, you'll remember this, the governments could not come to an agreement on subsidy negotiations. Simon Reisman flew home in a fury, said that's it, they're, they're, they're meanies, <laughs> and I give up. And so Pat Carney and Michael Wilson and John Crosby went down and met with the, with, you know, the, the American negotiators and came up with the deal. The deal was, We'll sign the agreement, and then we'll set up uh, committees to establish subsidies over the next five to seven years, okay? It was, to me, it's like buying a house, signing it, and then saying, we'll talk about how much it costs later, right? 
So the only two subsidies that were allowed, on which they came to definitions right in the agreement, were the following. The first was the search for new energy supplies. And the Americans don't mind if Canadian taxpayers pay for the search for expensive new energy supplies, right? Because then, under the proportional sharing, we have to share it with them. So we are actually, in effect, subsidizing American consumers of our energy. It makes me crazy. <laughs> I eat meals for breakfast to get through this, you know? The other subsidized, the area allowed for subsidy was defense and military production. Because, of course, that's how the United States has its own industrial policy through the Pentagon. They didn't want us challenging it. So we are allowed, to our little heart's content, we are allowed to help and nurture and develop with government funds the defense industry, um, component parts for the American defense industry in this country. If we want to build, if we want to start and nurture and build, uh, say, an environmental cleanup technology in this country, can't do it. It's not allowed. And you should know this, and this has had no press, that Julius Katz, who is Carla Hill's next in line, the second in line of the, for, for the negotiators on the American side, boasted in, in an interview the other day that Canada had, of course, anticipated that the discussions for subsidies would go on into the NAFTA. They dumped it. They, they, it's, it's gone. That's it. We lost the ability to have a common subsidies code. He called it a loss, a serious loss for Canada. <clears throat> that means we are now totally gu uh, guided uh, by U.S. trade action, whatever they consider to be an unfair practice of ours, they now have the right to come after us on. That's the third. The fourth is social programs. You are reading, as I am, we all are this week, about how we're ending family allowances. We're going to give it to some needing poor. And I'm interested to find out who that's going to be, who, who, who's, who's eligible by this government standards. We've ended universality in old age pensions. We've just given the transnational drug companies 20-year patent protection, and I understand there's talk that they're going to add, they're planning to add it another five years in a few in a few years. That was anticipation of NAFTA because that was one of the American requests, which is in NAFTA. It's going to kill our generic drug industry. It's going to probably kill the seniors program for drug universal drug benefits because we won't be able to afford it. Uh, and here's the one that I think is the most clear proof when we talk about harmonization. You know how Jeffrey Simpson says, well, maybe the Americans will harmonize to us. I love this, right? When Canada signed the U.S. Canada Free Trade Agreement, uh, the first thing we did, because we knew the Americans were going to come after us, was we changed our unemployment insurance system because we had a system where government, employers, and employees all paid in. The Americans have a system where only employers and employees pay in, and they said, your government assistance in this area is an unfair trade practice, and we're going to launch a suit against you. So rather than have a big fight and be embarrassed, our government just changed the legislation and removed government, so it's now between employers and employees. And then they harmonized other things. They shortened the length of eligibility and all sorts of things. Very much harmonized to the American system. Pre-free trade, in the United States, which is still the case in the States, around one in four Americans is insured against unemployment, okay? Is eligible for unemployment insurance. In Canada, pre-free trade, uh, over 80%, it was close to 85% of us were eligible for to receive unemployment insurance if we lost our jobs. The statistics just came out last week. Are you ready? This is great harmonization. Do you think the Americans have moved up to be closer to us? Mm -hmm. We are now at a, at, a, at a rate of 58%. Only 58% of Canadians are eligible for unemployment insurance as the job losses mount in three years. That's what I mean by harmonization. Give you another example. <clears throat> it's a very serious one because this talks about to the this speaks to the heart of political sovereignty. Bob Ray came to power in Ontario two years ago. Maybe the most major plank, certainly one of the two or three top planks, was that he was going to create a public automobile insurance scheme like three other provinces in Canada have. <clears throat> and what he immediately came afoul of, although I, he's never said this publicly and I fault him for it because it would have helped us, he came afoul of the free trade agreement. Under the free trade agreement, if a provincial or federal government wants to make public something that's been private, so create a, a new public a social program or a crown agency or crown corporation or public automobile insurance. It's called a monopoly in the agreement. It's not our language, so you can see who wrote it. If we want to do that, we have to A, 
advise Washington who can retaliate against us if they don't like it. But more importantly, we have to be prepared to pay Article 1205 financial compensation to American private industry that, not that we're kicking out, that might one day have made money under the national treatment laws in that sector in the future. So the automobile, the American, the, um, I mean, I said, I know, it makes you mad, it makes me mad, that's why I'm here. <laughs> the American automobile insurance industry promptly launched a huge campaign, went to Carla Hills, who went to Michael Wilson, who went to Bob Ray, and they, they put out a study that said, you will owe us upfront a billion dollars just to start this thing. And so we're not even saying that's full compensation, just to start this process. And guess what? They backed off, but we're not getting our public automobile insurance. And this is what we're talking about when we say political sovereignty. This isn't some esoteric kind of wacky thing. This is real. And the last is foreign investment. The new stats have just come out from uh, stats from Investment uh, Canada. <coughs> Since its inception, <clears throat> over 4,500 Canadian companies have been taken over by mostly American, although not totally. <coughs> Pardon me, that's just the voice given out after all these speeches. 93.2% of those are straight takeovers, which we also know causes job loss, because very often they're takeovers to shut down production, to shift it over to a warehouse because they want to shut down the competition. Under 7% is new investment dollars in Canada. Now when the government says, we need research and development, we have to have foreign investment, we have to attract it here, I'm sorry, that kind of money is not going to create research and development in this country. Now NAFTA adds a whole dimension. The government is trying to say, ah, NAFTA is nothing, it's just a little agreement between Canada and Mexico. That's not true. NAFTA is the next step in this process and not only deepens and, and, and enlarges the, the free trade agreement, but it takes us a step closer to the whole hemispheric deal, which you know, every step takes it a step further and harder for us to get out of. <coughs> um, NAFTA will <coughs> excuse me, open up our telecommunications system, much of which was kept closed under the free trade agreement. <coughs> it opens up transportation, it opens up not only our air transportation, but our ground transportation. It opens up for the first time provincial rights under the free trade agreement, the first free trade agreement, the system was that only governments could be challenged, national governments. Now they'll be able to actually challenge financial institutions that are controlled by uh, provinces and a dozen other things, marketing boards, a whole host of, of areas. We're just studying it now, the thing is 2,000 pages long. So we have the team set up and we'll have more information within, <coughs> excuse me, I'd say another week, we'll have more information. I've got one. <laughs> got you all caught. <laughs> now, okay, that's it, it's gone. No more coffee anymore. But more importantly, I guess, and I want to talk about what bringing Mexico into this does to Mexico and to us. I know many of you have worked in <coughs> areas with, in, in conjunction with uh, Latin American groups. I've toured the Maquiladoras, and I, I haven't got language to tell you what it's like. I mean, I try, will try, but I, nothing I say is going to describe to you what we're building the future of our country on. Maquiladoras are factories that are set up as twins of American factories that, that make the component parts. Once free trade comes in, they're treated as American companies, just like the situation under the first free trade agreement. They, they hire kids, they're not supposed to, but I've been in, in factories where these kids were 13 and 14 and 15 years old, mostly female. They get pregnant, <clears throat> they're out. If they talk back or form any association, they're out. If they have babies that are deformed from the toxic poison they breathe in, they're out and there's no compensation for their children, they are their babies. Um, they work in conditions of, well, it's Charles Dickens, but add toxic waste, add toxic poison. We stood by <coughs> inside you know, one young woman who was working without a mask, and the stuff was dripping into a bucket, and we all had tears coming down our faces and headaches and upset stomachs from standing there for, for a few minutes watching this thing. We walked outside of one industrial park, and we watched where they were, they were plowing, it just looked like a moonscape, plowing this earth into this thing. We looked down and it was like a black witch's lagoon, a black 
bubbling toxic stew that was steaming with the green and red kind of vapors coming up out of it. We watched where it seeped into the ground and met up with a small river that ran into the Tijuana River. And it met up with raw sewage because the burials, of course, people are being displaced off their farms by corporate farming. So they're all coming north looking for these jobs and there's no sewage treatment. And we watched where it went right through burials where families lived. Families told us that 10 years ago that water was crystal clear, you could drink it. I took a pencil and I put the pencil in the water like that and it came out stripped. I saw a little kid sitting, little baby sitting along the side of this thing, covered in sores, drinking Pepsi Cola from baby bottles, because there's no water anymore. And of course, they can't afford milk and, and, um, and juice. The, the Pepsi Cola wars are dead serious wars. <laughs> like, they're wars in Central and South America. It's not, it's not a cute little Pepsi Coke uh, jingles that we see here. It's serious stuff. Um, <laughs> We went, but we went through through uh, the communities where, where literally they, you come out the, sh the front doors of these these huts, and there's green puddles, green and red and purple puddles. Yet the tragedy is, of course, that it took a, a rash of babies who were in, born in Brownsville, Texas, without any brains, without with holes in their heads, <clears throat> in the last year for people to start saying, "My goodness, what are we putting in the ground?" Because Brownsville is right across the, the river from Matamoros, Texas. And there are a number of chemical companies there. One is called Stepan Chemical. And the AFL-CIO one night came over and took some samples. We were chased off by private guards, but took some samples of the soil around Stepan Chemical. And they found one chemical that's been linked to the, the, the uh, defects in the babies born on both sides of the river, of course, in, in concentrations 63,000 times the allowable, the allowable limit in the United States. Not five times, not 10 times. 63,000 times. It makes the Love Canal look like a, a you know, a nice clean lake. Uh, what we're building on, that the future we're building on, is is beyond anything that I could describe to you. Now you can say to me, and you'd be right, free trade didn't discover third world exploitation. It didn't discover transnational behavior, and that's absolutely true. But it is building a model in North America and cementing in a model of deregulation, of privatization, of turning over all decisions to these transnational companies that is going to be very hard to reverse. Pat Carney said it to the Canadian Petroleum Association in 1987. She said, we have deregulated the energy industry, and now we will bring in a free trade agreement so that no future government can re-regulate. And that's what I want to stress to you so strongly. Free trade locks in this system. Without getting rid of it, you can't undo the damage that's happened in other areas, and you cannot start to rebuild the kind of programs that we need to, to reclaim our country, to reclaim our democracy. So that's the bad news. <laughs> There's a lot of it. The good news is good, and I want to I want to I want to try to spend as much time on the good as the bad, and then open this up. I talk a little bit about what we're doing, and then what I think we have to do. 1985, we founded the Council of Canadians. <clears throat> Council of Canadians is non-partisan, non-profit. We're now 22,000 strong across the country and growing. And we are the organization that individuals belong to. We have chapters in many communities, and we, you know, we're the we're keeping the in many ways keeping the issue alive. In 1987, we hosted a meeting. It was the third meeting between uh, Reagan and, and Mulroney. Remember, they called it the, the Shamrock Summit. So we held a meeting, we called it um, the Maple Leaf Summit. And we asked um, many national organizations from a whole range of areas and sectors <clears throat> to one place, the Shadow Laurier, and we launched what was then called the Pro-Canada Network. It's now called the Action Canada Network. And Action Canada now has 54 national organizations that belong to it. Things, organizations like <clears throat> Canadian Labour Congress and all its affiliates, the National Action Committee on the Status of Women, the National Farmers Union, ACTRA, Canadian Conference of the Arts, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, um, CUSO, Oxfam, Interpares, uh, the Canadian Teachers Federation, the Canadian Federation of Students, several seniors, national seniors groups, and on and on. We are, in my opinion, the most important untold story, political story in this country since, I don't know since when, since ever, maybe. Because we are setting up a coalition of groups working with the individuals who joined through the council, as we're kind of the arm through which individuals come into this network. 
to fight what we're calling this corporate agenda. And it's been largely ignored by the press. They're used to picking their superstars and doing stories on them and how we dress and things. <laughs> They're not much interested in understanding, and I, this is no slight to any media here, I'm talking about the major media outlets. Uh, there, there has, <laughs> no, no, no. Really, I wasn't. I'm not because I, I don't. I don't believe in doing that with the media. There are many wonderful people writing good stuff, but, but I think that 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 the media or national media, like national government, tend to see things in the way that they've been, and we haven't yet maybe seen how this new movement has come together. And what we're doing is that we're not only working to put together an electoral strategy, we're not only, which I'll talk about with you, we're not only working towards putting out alternatives to this, we're working with our counterparts in the United States and Mexico to form a three-country opposition to this NAFTA, this type of free trade agreement on the North American continent. We are not narrow nationalists, we're not isolationists, we're not you know, protectionists and nostalgic and so on. We very deeply believe in working with our counterparts in other countries, because we see this free trade agreement as a win, win, win for the corporations of the three countries, and a lose, lose, lose for the working people and the environment of all three countries. So we're working with them. And it is because we have tenaciously refused to stop talking about all this, that the government is doing what revealed this week in the NAFTA tapes, and I urge you to get a hold of McLean's, this week's McLean's if you haven't had a chance to see it. What happened was somebody leaked a, a, uh, the tapes, the transcript of, a, of a, a conference call, it was a phone call from all across the country, with I guess there were about 12 senior aides to Tories, and they were talking about how they're going to discredit us, and how they're launching a multi-million dollar campaign to get to win the election through pushing through free trade, through pushing the NAFTA. Now here's what they're calling us. I am an old left-wing crypto-communist, anti-free trade, an NDP liberal con artist. <laughs> It's just astounding stuff. You're going to have to read it for yourself. But a couple of things to tell you is that they very clearly outline their strategy. And, and, and that's documents into every house, uh, <coughs> television ads, radio ads. They're going to put everything we say, every speech we make, every editorial we write into a huge computer bank and monitor it. it really, it's really kind of scary behavior. And they're going to use millions of taxpayers' dollars for this. But they're also going to use what they call third-party support. And you will remember from the last election, the Business Council on National Issues, the Chamber of Commerce, the Canadian Manufacturers Association all got very much behind the government on this. We estimate they spent around $56 million on the pro-free trade campaign. This is just the business community. Well, guess what? Ramsey, who's the chief of staff to Michael Wilson, says in this conference call, there's no doubt that third-party support is the best thing we've got. It's what sells best. We've got a lot of third-party support organized nationally. He goes into the details here. <clears throat> he says in 10 days they've sent out over a quarter of a million kits to businesses in Canada to get them on side. It's a phenomenal amount of money. But this, and then he says this, uh, GM is considering writing to all of their employees. Remember last time how a number of employers badgered their employees and said, you know, you'll lose your jobs if you don't vote for this. He says, we've got most of the big associations now. We've got a lot lined up. Now, one of the people on the call who's unidentified says, just as long as they say it, Jim, that's the thing. As long as it's a nice headline that somewhere in the story they attribute this to free trade. You know, have you got that much influence or control that you can get these third-party people to say this and not leave it to osmosis? Ramsey says, good point, and we're working on that with them. And it's very clear that they're working in tandem, as they did in the last election, to uh, tell us that we're wrong in our belief that this has not been good for us, even though everything we can see tells us that. Uh, it's a very revealing piece, and I'd urge you to read it. It's uh, the Globe and Mail mockingly said, what do we expect? What do we think was going to happen on these conference calls? At no point, and we've got the full transcript back at the office, do they say why NAFTA's good, how free trade has been wonderful for us, how much they care about the Canadian people, how they're working for us. They don't particularly talk about any of that. So what I'm here tonight for is to get you enthused, moving, uh, joining us, 
as individuals, I really urge you to join the council. We are nonprofit, we are nonpartisan, we're mostly volunteers. We've got a very small office staff. I'm a volunteer. Uh, but we need the financial clout uh, and the people numbers, both on the ground and enabled to, to make to help us get the information, the literature out as widely as we can. Through the Council of Canadians, as individuals, you're part of the Action Canada Network. And then I would also urge any of you who belong to local groups or coalitions, environmental teachers, labor, and so on, to, to take part in forming a coalition here. Action Canada is blossoming in uh, BC. There's a, a strong Vancouver uh, coalition now. Victoria started one. Comox is this incredible one going. Um, Kamloops is starting one. Uh, so it's, it's something that I, you know, I think that it's it's understandable that between elections we all kind of, you know, we're exhausted. But I think we need to come back. So I'm really urging you to help us rebuild this movement. We have an assembly with the Action Canada Network in um, in October in Prince Edward Island. Now that that's representatives at the national level. Council of Canadians is having our annual general meeting November 20th, 21st, 22nd. We'd love to have you. It's in Ottawa. We're having a great trade debate between Dave Barrett, Roy McLaren, we've asked Michael Wilson, I'm sure he'll say no. But actually the point of it is to, we very much um, disapprove of and disagree with the Liberals' position on renegotiation. We don't think it's, it's, it's doable. We think in fact that it's a cop-out because you can't renegotiate. What are you going to do? You mean the Americans are going to give us back our energy? <laughs> are they going to give us back our banking system? Are they going to give us back our jobs? Not likely. Um, so we feel very strongly that we have to make the clear point. The NDP is saying that they would abrogate the agreement, that the Liberals are fudging on it. And we need to make this very clear because uh, most people say, oh, they're both against it and don't see a distinction. So we want that issue to come out very clearly and it will be part of building an electoral strategy. Um, and we can talk about that in as, <clears throat> in as much detail as you want. As well through Action Canada, and I don't mean to say we're doing this and we don't know, know, need you. We all need to work on this together. But we are trying to put together alternatives and gather the alternatives that are out there. We're looking at a fair tax alternative. We're looking at a fair trade act where we would say, these are the rules under which trade should be negotiated, right? Uh, that transnational corporations do not get to control trade systems, that democratically elected governments do, that uh, the government should be able to retain political sovereignty and, 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 and protect their culture, their food sources, their resources, their environment, the conditions under which foreign business, foreign investment comes into the country, uh, and that there be basic minimum standards, environmental and social standards, for all the members of the trade community. We're looking at full employment. We're looking at taking Canadian control back over our resources and our culture, our food supply, rules for foreign investment, laws on corporate reconstruction or uh, concentration and we're looking at putting this under the rubric of, a, of an economic re reconstruction and, and industrial development program. Uh, this is big stuff and it's where, you know, obviously it's a, it's a huge job and something that we need as much input as we can have on it. But it's no longer good enough just to oppose. We're now having to say there are alternatives and, and that's very important for us to work on. I guess I'll just end this part of what I'm saying with a, a, a personal, private story for you, and then I want to open this up for discussion. When we all look at why we care about this country, and there are you know, a thousand different reasons, as many people as there are here, there are reasons. For me, part of it is my own personal background. My mother was married when she was 20 years old to a man who was also 20, who went off to war. They don't even married six weeks. <clears throat> he went off to be one of, he was one of the first Canadian boys to join the RAF in Britain. And he said to her at the airport, I won't be back, so, you know, I won't, so don't expect it. So she, she, they said goodbye, and sure enough, he was missing in action right away. What she didn't know at the time was that, and he didn't know, was that she was pregnant with my older sister. So she moved back in with her parents, in a, they lived in a small community in New Brunswick, Duchesne, New Brunswick and uh, waited the war to be over. She actually didn't find out that he died for two years because somebody who'd seen his plane shot down was taken prisoner. <clears throat> so it was when he got out that he was able to confirm. So that was, you know, that was a long and painful process. My own dad was also in the war. 
He spent five years as a commando and uh, saw very hard fighting, although he never talks about it, but I've heard from other people. Was wounded in the Battle of, of Italy, the Battle of Rome. Sent home, intended to go back, and uh, then the war ended. And uh, actually how they met was very nice. My, um, he, he's kind of absent-minded. He had a date with the girl who lived next door to my grandparents. And he was coming up, he was coming to pick her up and came up the wrong walk. <laughs> and my uh, grandma loved Billy McGrath. She'd always had her eye on him, even though they were grandma was Scottish and he was Irish. Never lived, you know, she forgave him for that, but, but she had her eye, she had her eye on Billy McGrath, right? She said, Well, look who's coming up the walk. It's Billy McGrath. And you go put some comb your hair, she said to my mother. My mother said, You can't do that. He's got a date with Mary next door. My grandmother said, if you can't do this, shut up, get, get in the back. <laughs> so my dad came up the wall and said, have I got the right house? My grandmother said, you sure do, Billy McGrath. <laughs> Two months later, they were married. <laughs> I always think that Mary's still next door thinking, Billy McGrath, 60 years old. <laughs> Where is he? Well, I'm not going to wait any longer. But I tell you this because my dad decided one of the things he'd seen and many horrible things he'd seen in the war was <coughs> marshalling. Uh, he'd been involved in some of the juries and stuff. And he became very deeply opposed to corporal capital punishment. And one, was one of the key people to get rid of capital punishment in this country, he wrote a book in 1955 called Should Canada Abolish the Gallows and the Lash? He was in prison reform, that's where he spent uh, his, his life's work was, was that. And my, one of my earliest memories was watching my dad on This Hour Has Seven Days with Laurie Lapierre and um, Patrick Watson. And he was debating the hangman. And the hangman was always named Mr. Ellis. It was, it was a pseudonym, right? And the hangman had a, a hood on. And my dad was sitting debating the hangman. My dad never smoked, and my dad was puffing on oh. <laughs> ran on television. Anyway, he, he felt very much that to make sense of what he had seen, he had to do something to at least end a part of what he felt caused this thing, right? And he spent his life, uh, that was what he gave to Canada. And I feel that I owe something back to those people, to my sister's father who died, to my mother who spent those years you know, not knowing and the pain that that must have caused, to what my father went through in the war, to the decisions he made, to the work that he's done. And if I, I watch, like we all do, are becoming more um, Americanized. And by American, I don't mean the people. I am not anti-American. And we're working very closely with our counterparts. I mean the system, the economic and social system that has uh, has become so much a part of that country. As, as this happens to us, I, I fear very deeply for the future of the different kind of system we have and the different kind of values. So I'm just going to end the formal part of this by saying, if you want to know what to do, want to know who's going to save this patient or take it back, go home and look in the mirror tonight. And then, instead of saying, what can I do, the question is, what can we do? And we've got to find each other in these communities, as individuals, as groups. We've got to find each other across the country, and it's a big country, and I've been everywhere. <laughs> and we've got to come together through these organizations, through connections, to say that this is our country, our democracy, and we're taking it back. We have been, as I said in the last book I wrote, that we're kind of walking towards, sleepwalking towards extinction. That we are a politically illiterate people. We are too trusting of governments and elites to run our country. And we have not only got to get rid of this government and replace it with one that's going to work on our behalf, not for transnational companies. We not only have to, to go through real electric reform, including, I believe, proportional representation, the end of third party spending, the kind of dominance that these, kind of, these people can have, and the ability to take our money. And they only got caught here. I mean, this is a slush fund. I think it's the GST money myself. <laughs> my, my GST money. Not only do we have to do that, but then we have to set about the serious business of setting up real democracy. There should be citizens advisory groups on the environment in every community in this country. If you don't like what's happening around uh, energy, what can you do? There's no energy board to go to anymore. There's nowhere you can go to register your concern. You can write a letter to the editor. You can bark at your MP. Your MP's got no power anymore. 
Uh, we have got to find ways to return this country to real democracy, and that's a very big job. And I believe that it can best be done in tandem with political parties through a non-partisan citizens coalition, uh, like the one that we're putting together, progressive, democratic, concerned about uh, the right of Canadians to make our own political decisions about our future. If, if we, we have to take back our nation, we have to take back our political sovereignty, we have to take back our resources, not to hoard them, but to, to, to guard them, to, gu to use them wisely. We have to take back our, our economy, we have to take back our, our, our political rights, um, and we have to do it because we owe that in an insane world. We owe a sane Canada. We have played that role in the past and we should play that role in the future. And I think it's going to take the rest of our lives to do this, I have to tell you. But then, what else have we to do? Thank you. What Bob Ray ran up against is exactly what you're talking about. <clears throat> I believe that there would be a great deal of gnashing of teeth on the American side. I think there would be some trade retaliation. I think there would be some companies that would leave. Um, and I think there would be an enormous amount of pressure by our own business community not to do this. My argument to that, however, is that's all happening anyway. <laughs> The free trade agreement gave the, the United States corporations the best tool they have to club us over the head. At least if we take it back, it's one less tool they have. Give you an example, West Coast fishing. It used to be that BC said if you catch fish off our coast, you have to uh, process it on our, in our, on our land so that we can get some secondary industry from it. The Americans have long wanted access to that fish directly, and they have they pay less money to their workers and so on. So they, you know, they they wanted that. Um, they took us to the GATT, and the GATT said that's an unfair trade restriction. You can't continue to make that requirement. Well, that was under the GATT. However, without free trade, we could have said, okay, we'll do something that has the same effect. We'll place an export tax, an export tariff on those fish, those raw, unprocessed fish, so that it'll, it'll be beneficial for it to stay here and, and be processed here. So it would have had the same effect. Under the free trade agreement, we can't do that. So the government said, we give up. It's like the Americans took the gap in one hand and the free trade agreement in the other and batted us about the head, right? So my first argument is that's happening anyway. Companies are leaving anyway. Companies are leaving because the tariff walls have gone down and they don't have to stay here anymore. Um, the Americans are acting, American businesses are acting like bullies anyway. And under the GATT, if we have a dispute between our two countries, we go to the GATT, and the GATT countries pay for the dispute to be handled. The governments pay for it. Under the free trade agreement, the dispute is, is paid for by the, comp by the industry that launches it. So, I mean, we're not as big in most cases as American uh, industries in, in, in most sectors. So they're always going to have more money than we have, and they're always going to win those disputes. I mean, they, even if we technically win, they can go back and change the wording and come back at us. So um, I, I think that the, 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 the concern that there's going to be retaliation is real. But I think that we have to decide here, us tonight and over the next few months, do, do we want to be economically in trouble in a system harmonizing to the United States, in a system we no longer control, or do we want to be economically in trouble, because I think we are either way, quite frankly, 
but back in control of our own destiny. And personally, I'd rather work to rebuild a country called Canada than try to stop the slide as a satellite and a kind of hinterland into the US. But I think your question is a really important one, and I think we have to talk about it, because that's certainly going to be what comes to get thrown at us a lot. Yes? I think the master plan clearly is total amalgamation by the United States, and I find it somewhat optimistic, not to say naive, that we think we can, you know, vote this Goliath out, that there's more drastic changes have only occurred in other countries with revolutions, and I really think if they vote this one out, and we are renegotiated out, I think it's somewhat very optimistic, hopefully. Well, the alternative is, you know, is, is armed confrontation, which I would, you know, not obviously never advocate. I think the United States would have a harder time being militarily tough on us than they would with countries like Nicaragua, simply because we look so much like them in the world's eyes. And that's not, not that's not a good reason for them not to do it, but it, in fact, I think there is a racial reality here. You know that we look like. We look too much like Americans for the world to tolerate they're doing that to us. I think it would come more from trade retaliation. I project to the that, that the alternative is a horrendous bureaucratic maze of small niggly issues every time there's some sort of a uh, problem that comes up and uh, some sort of international trade problem. And so that this is actually, even though it's sort of onerous in some ways, it's more efficient. We can, the, the process for dispute settlement is much easier and we get things done quicker and it's cheaper and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just wondering what your advice is about how to how to counter that kind of argument, what kind of strategies yeah, could have that would be an alternative yeah. that would solve that problem? If it's true, I don't know if it's well, many, No, it's a very good argument. It's one of the best arguments they have, and so thank you for raising it. Um, it is a fair argument. We, the United States is our major trading partner, and frankly, we should have rules to guide it. What I would argue is that's not what this agreement is. This agreement gives away way more than, than it is, it's, it's about way more than establishing trade rules and establishing tariff, a structure for taking down tariffs. If it were that, I don't think any of us would be sitting in this room tonight so worried. There might be parts of it we, we would be worried about. Um, so I, I think that one of the things that we can counter with is that, first of all, most of the goods between our countries, it's almost 90% now, go back and forth without tariffs. It's a very small percentage that we're left with that we're disputes, in dispute, and we can set up mechanisms to deal with that. And we can keep the trade dispute panel if that's, if we do feel that it's working. I'm not convinced it is. But if we were to feel that, that if, we, if we were to feel that as a country that that was in our best interest, we could still talk about settling disputes and coming to some common agreement about subsidies and so on. That is, we still have to get out of this agreement. And I think I would I'd make the distinction when you're arguing with that, that, that we're not against having those kind of common rules. And in fact, I'm not against the concept of a trade and development pact for the North American continent that would talk about bringing standards up and sharing um, the kinds of, of, of information and knowledge we need to help Mexico and other countries um, come up to our standards. But until we see that the Americans would be willing to do that, then I think that's a long way off. Um, I think it would be dangerous for Canada. I want to say something though, hopeful, because I don't want us to be, I know the negativity and I understand it, believe me, I, I deal with it a lot myself, but I also think we have to be positive. I think Clinton and Gore are going to win. And if they win, and there's a democratically controlled House or Congress, I think we're, we may have a very different situation in the States. I met with uh, um, Clinton's chief uh, trade advisor, and there's no question they have very serious con concerns about the NAFTA. Gephardt, who's the third ranking Democrat in the US Congress, has come out strongly against NAFTA. And I think they're going to have a real run for their money in that country if he wins. So it may be that it'll get killed in the United States, or at least killed in this form, which gives us a good platform to go back to the Canadian people on with the first agreement. So, you know, I want us to, to see that it's not all, um, it's not all, it's not all against us. You know, I want us to see that there's a lot of hope here, because I think there is. Yeah. Hi. What I'd like to know is, is because these organizations have a lot of pull, and are willing to put their votes behind any other political party that is willing to go up against the
categories. Yeah. What is the position of the action of Canada Network? Okay, I, I think there are distinctions though. The Canadian Labour Congress supports the NDP, and I don't think they would vote for Liberals. Uh, although, and I think what you might have read was about the um, um, the uh, public public alliance, public service alliance that has recently come out saying that they're going to defeat. I think that's probably the article you read. You should know there's a lot of controversy about their stand in the labor movement, a lot, because they did say in, in writings where they didn't think the NDP could win, and they thought it was a good a liberal candidate, they would support the liberal candidate. That's not CLC position. National Action Committee and the Status of Women Like Our Group, the Council of Canadians, is nonpartisan. What we are going to do in the council, and, the, and different members of Action Canada will, will do different, do this in different ways. We are going to think smart this time. Okay? We're not going to scatter our energies and scatter our work. We are going to work to defeat pro-free trade, pro-corporate agenda candidates of whatever political stripe. Now, at the moment, those people are found in the Tories. I would say just about all of them in the Reform and some Liberals. I think the Liberal Party is very divided between what I call social liberals and the business liberals. So divided that you can hear them speak and you hear this guy's a, this person's an NDP or this person's a Tory, that they're trying to fit this together. So we feel that the best that we can hope for is to prevent the Liberals, frankly, from getting a majority by targeting for defeat certain right-wing Liberals and then to have the NDP and Liberals form a post-election coalition based on abrogation and a reconstruction program. Now that sounds complicated and hard, and it is, but you know, we don't have an easy situation here. The NDP is at about 16% in the polls, so we're, we're dealing with the hand that we've got here. What we feel that we could do is if we did it strategically, that is if we looked at certain ridings and put our energy into defeating in some areas and supporting in others, um, and then put, put that put our energy into a, a selected number of writings instead of scattering it. <clears throat> we could probably, I think we could probably uh, help to have that effect. So that's what we're going to be doing. I'm glad you raised it because I did want to get into the political strategy. It's a very um, controversial issue within the movement because within the movement there are politically partisan people and groups. And what we're saying is put aside your partisanship for the purpose of coming together to do this thing. Um, so it's 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 dicey. Yes. Uh, how does the uh, fact that Canada belongs to the OAS organization, the American state, how does that affect the free trade running down in Chile and all the parts of South America? Is that a political agenda as well as an economic agenda? Yeah, I think joining the OAS was was part of our desire to Brian Mulroney's desire, not ours, and I'm not going to claim it desire to be an extension of the United States there. And I think we serve the same role there that we serve in the G7, and that's to do what the Americans tell us. I don't, I frankly don't believe that we belong in the G7. I don't think we're a major power. I think we're only there to back up the Americans and puff up Brian Mulroney when he feels he needs it. Um, but yes, I think it's very much part of the agenda. And I, you know, the OECD chief economist last week said NAFTA is a lose for Canada. So I can't see any way Canada can benefit. The government keeps talking about all the the, the new market we're going to have in Mexico, and he pointed out it's a continent away, <laughs> and they're poor. If there's anything where if, if, where it matters is the American market. We're going to lose a lot of our market in the United States because of the cheap goods coming in from Mexico. So it's going to be a double whammy. Not only are we going to lose jobs, we're going to lose our share of the, the American market um, based on continued poverty for Mexico. It's not even as if we're saying, well, let's equalize it. We'll give away some that Mexico will gain. That's not the model. It's not what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I, can, I can travel around to a lot of communities and uh, they're involved in the coalition networks. Can you speak to examples of how people in local communities are, you know, the various constituents are kind of coming together. They're all also involved in yeah. each of our kind of causes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, in case you couldn't hear the question, <clears throat> what are some examples of how people are coming together in communities to do this work? I guess the first thing to say is that it's very recent that, it's been, that Action Canada's not been either federally, nationally, or provincially organized. It's only in the last few months that it started to become community oriented, and I'm thrilled <laughs> with that. So we're still in a transition period between 
you know, it started as, as these 28 national groups and it went up to 54, so we have these meetings with the leadership of those groups and then different provinces said, well, we should set up a provincial structure too. And mostly it's controlled from the capital of the province. So here it was Vancouver. It was the BC ACN run from Vancouver and there were not coalitions in other communities. Now people are saying, well, we want to do it here and coordinate it. And so we're just building that now. So what I can say to you is that you're going to have to work with us to develop how this happens as we go along. It seems to me that in BC, you're going to have to work with Comox and Victoria and, and, and Vancouver and all the other groups that are forming, and they really are forming. I mean, it's just overnight in some situations to talk about how you will now become a BC coalition that isn't dominated by Vancouver, because it's only been Vancouver up till now, and then how you will fit into the other picture and how we can regionally support you. Our dream, okay, is to have paid staff coordinate, coordinators uh, provincially and then regionally, and like regionally in the provinces all across the country. But to do that, I mean, we, you know, we need money, obviously. That's, that's clearly obvious. And I want to say two quick other things. One of them is that all of us are involved in a hundred other things. I mean, if you're in this room, you're probably involved in one of a dozen very important causes. I can't say strongly enough how I think that this should come to the top of your list for now. I doesn't mean to stop caring about the environment or anything else, but if we don't win this battle, we're not going to have the clout to make the decisions around those other areas. Environmental decisions will not be made in this country. I argue that to an extent they're not now anyway. So I would say that, you know, in terms of your own time and priorities, if this one could come up to the top until the election, it would be I mean, I think we need a nationwide push on this. The uh, last thing I want to say on this is to that the Council of Canadians and the ACN work together really closely at the national and provincial levels, and it would be wonderful if you could do that here. <clears throat> Council has individuals, sometimes maybe they're seniors or people as individuals who don't have other, like they're not part of a labor movement or whatever, but they care about this and they're part of this and they want to physically, actively be involved. And they can be really a um, uh, solid partnership with the Action Canada Network Coalition. So it's a way to meld the individuals in the community with the groups that have taken <coughs> a commitment to this. There's one way. I check with this other. Okay, I've got other people. I know. Yeah. What sort of group? <laughs> Great joke. There's an American and a Canadian in front of a firing squad. And they say to them both, you can have one last wish before you die. So the Canadian says, I want to give my my feelings, my thoughts on the Canadian Constitution. So they said, okay, we'll go get this man a soapbox. And while they're getting it, they said to the American, what do you want? He said, shoot me before I have to listen to <laughs> <laughs> The question is, how is the, how is the Constitution linked to NAFTA, and how is the outcome going to affect it? I don't know, it is so complicated. First of all, I look at the Constitution and I feel stymied like a lot of us do because it's the first chance to come to peace with the First Nations. And I don't want to say none of that. No, I know, I agree, I was going to say that. I was, no really, I was going to come to the Women's Party in a minute. That's the first thing. It's time to come to some kind of peace with Quebec if Quebec accepts it. But quite frankly, I don't think Quebec's going to accept the distinct society clauses. I think the Senate is better as an elected Senate than it is presently, although it drives me crazy to think of paying those people off for 30 years. It just drives me crazy. Um, so, like a lot of Canadians, we're presented with this and we're going to be saying no to Quebec and no to First, pe First Nations peoples if we say no to this. Then I look at it from the point of women, Native women, visible minorities who have all been left out of this. And, and that really feels that there's been an actual diminution of, of rights for women under, under the Canada Clause. And I look at it from the Council's point of view, and we are very concerned with the, um, the uh, devolution of power to the provinces. For instance, they're talking about giving forestry to the provinces. But they don't mention anything about national environmental standards. Well, I mean, I drove through the clear cutting on the way here today. We, we have to have national standards. And what will happen is that provinces will behave like countries in a free trade zone. They will lower their environmental standards to attract business to compete with other provinces. <clears throat> we don't have strong national standards. It'll be the same in labor market training. 
Uh, it's unclear about the unemployment insurance. Quebec says you did agree that we can take it. Other provinces say, well, we weren't sure. The federal government says, no, we're going to keep it. It's unclear. So I think there are enormous links in terms of, of a, I think, an agenda to decentralize power, which fits into this North American free trade model. Uh, and it worries me very, very greatly. For our group, what we're saying now is that we refuse to jump on this bandwagon, yes or no, on, 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 at their timetable. We feel that we have, have a right to de demand clarification on, uh, on what they're doing. We have a right to demand clarification about the decentralizing aspects and so on. And, uh, and we're going to provide as much information as we can to Canadians to help us collectively make up our minds. Now, what happens if it passes? If it passes by everybody, then it's still in the world and it's still got to go through the provincial legislatures, but we can get back to the economy which is a reason a lot of people are going to vote for it. I mean, that's just a reality. A lot of people are holding their noses and saying, I don't even care what's in it. I want to get on with the economy. I want to get on to talk to you about that. If it passes in English Canada but fails in Quebec, I think we're in a very serious situation. I don't think we can force it. If it's no to Quebec, it's no. And I think they have the right to say no. If it's no by the majority of Canadians generally, then we're back to square one. And of course, you know, we're going to have a hard time getting to this, which is a real problem. So I mean, I really feel stumped on this thing. What I do want to say, however, is that if it is a no by Canada or by Quebec, I think we have to go back and go, go back to the model that a number of us were talking about. We called it a three nations model. We were talking about recognizing the existence in Canada of three national communities, the First Nations, uh, Quebec, the French-speaking majority of Quebec, who have what we believe have a right to self-determination in the multicultural Canada, and that three nations can live within the nation-state of Canada in peace and harmony. We don't want to decentralize. Quebec does, so give Quebec the amount of autonomy it seeks and requires to live at peace with us. And it would take in exchange less power or have less of a say in the, in the running of the rest of Canada. Now, it's a, it's, it's, it's a not perfect model, but then not the, the model we have is clearly upsetting everybody. We're having a referendum about it. So I guess I want to say that if it does fail, if the, if the answer is no, I think we need to come up with a much more progressive framework than we had. I mean, you could love or hate Trudeau's model, but you knew what it was. But in this case, they weren't working from any model. It was horse trading, and that's what we've got, a horse traded package. And everybody's a little unhappy. And some people are very unhappy. So it's, uh, I, I don't think we should be bullied. That's the <coughs> thing I want to say. Yes, and then I'll go back to the back. Yeah. This is probably quite a naive question, but I, I keep wondering, why are the, why do the Conservatives have this agenda for this free trade? I mean, why? <laughs> I mean, is it, is it that they're controlled so much by big business? Or really what's the CIA? Okay, the question is, why Why did the Conservatives do this, if it's so unpopular, I'm assuming you're adding? And I would say it's a combination of political opportunism and ideology, some of, some of both. It's important to remember that when Brian Owen came to power in 1984, he was against free trade. He, Michael Wilson, and, and uh, Joe Clark were all on record as being against it. Only Crosby, whose dad told him to bring uh, Newfoundland into, into the American orbit, <laughs> Uh, only he was open. Free trade would be great. And within a year, they totally changed their minds. I don't think Brian Mulroney is ideologically particularly right wing. I think he wanted power. He got there, and then he said, "Now, who's going to who's going to come forward?" And it was the business community. It was the big business community, the Business Council on National Issues, which is the 160 large corporations in this country, have formed a very powerful lobby. And uh, they went to him, and, and I, I believe a great deal of money has exchanged hands. You just see little bits and pieces of it in here, but it's, there's no question in my mind. And they said, we will support you, and we will be your biggest boosters, and we want free trade, and we want deregulation, and we want privatization, and we want it now. And I don't think they've ever looked back. So we are up against an ideology here, and I think the Canadians have to make an ideological decision. And that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say here, so we can fight these things issue by issue, but, and that's important to do, but we have to see the whole package and say that there's a kind of an ideological struggle for the future of our soul. And, uh, you know, if, if that side wins and continues to do what it's doing, the country as we've known, it won't be here. I mean, it just, I'm not saying we'll be folded into the U.S. who want us, you know, in this condition, but we will, for all intents and purposes, will not control our own.
just a name. Up at the back, yeah. yeah. Tell me how the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement fits into the gap. General agreement on trade and tariffs. Very good question. I believe that the North American Free Trade Agreement is designed to undermine the GATT and set up a trade block to counter Europe and Japan that will do away with the GATT. See, Americans don't have as much clout in the international system because they're one player among a group as they do in a, in, a, in a free trade zone on this continent dominated by them. And I think they're saying, well, if it works for us at the Gap, that's fine. But if it doesn't, we're building this alternative here. And so I think that for Canadians to go along with that is helping destroy the international trading system, which we, I think is safer for us. Um, I also think that, uh, I know, I shouldn't say I think, what's become clear from the recent NAFTA tape, the, the NAFTA tapes, the NAFTA document, under the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, we have a choice between taking a dispute to the Gap or the free trade panels. Under the NAFTA, you have to have permission of both other countries to take it to the GATT. If, they, if either one of them wants you to take a dispute to the continental um, dispute system, that's where you have to take it. So it's going to be a lot less likely that we'll ever be able to use the GATT under the NAFTA. So it's, it's a piece-by-piece -piece removing of the North America out of the international system to build a fortress. I mean, the, mentally, the way to look at it is that we're building a fortress with no standards to feed the center, which is the United States. Yeah, I'm thinking about a, a, a recent article in Harper's Night yes. last month. Yes, excellent. Where uh, apparently, according to this guy who writes this article, Bush's whole agenda is to bring the American economy into the GATT sort of structure, like to banana republicanize the United States as well as this country, you know, to yeah. turn his own country into the Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it depends on who is an American, <laughs> you know. See, I argue that this system is bad for Americans. It's bad for the, the bottom two-thirds of America. But it is, so I guess it's, it's what you mean when you say American. If you're talking about the elites, the big corporations, the, the Republicans, and so on, it's terrific for them, and that's what they control. Uh, but it does discipline the people of the United States under a system. Because, you know, many of the same concerns that we have about North American free trade, we also have about the GATT. You know, that's the other problem, is the GATT is coming under a lot of the same kind of control now by the transnationals. Just going to take a couple more questions. Somebody, one down here, and then you, and then, so three more. Yes. Yes, many of us do hear you on the Council of Canadians, but uh, we talk about ideology. And uh, I would just like to make the point that the NDP has, from its very beginning, CCF, talked about democracy and fair economic practices. And even the transnationals have to eat, they have to live, they have to breathe. I don't think it's so complicated. I invite people to join the NDP and work to make a parliament in Canada that really does respond to people and works with people and for people and for this world and for international cooperation. And I do invite people to think very seriously about that. Thank you. Yes, here. <laughs> under the FTA or under FTA or NAFTA, is Canada able to come in like form an agreement with other countries, or do they have to get permission from either the U.S. or Mexico? Or it's a very good question. The question is, if is under GATT or under NAFTA, can Canada form our own agreements with other countries? Technically, technically, we could. But practically, it's impossible because you, what you're doing is you're, you're building a fortress. You're, you're, by your behavior and saying that there's going to be a special relationship with these countries, you have to work, any agreement that you make with another country has to, has to conform to the special favored nation status that you, of the countries you've signed to. If in any way we were to make an agreement with, say, Japan that was good for us around automobiles, we would have to break what we've now done, which is a 62.5% of content rule on the North American continent. And we couldn't do that. The Japanese have said, we will put no more auto parts companies into Canada. There's nothing in it for us. Now that there's no Canadian content, now that you've gone to this and they're furious, you know, we will, if we ever put anything on, on the American continent, we'll put it in Mexico and the southern United States. And they've said that. So in, in essence, nothing in there says, thou shalt not. But to do it, you would have to, to have any any practice whereby, whereby we could make Canada attractive to other countries. We'd have to break parts of what we've done here. We can't do it. 
So in, in, in effect, we're locking ourselves into the North American continent and it's those rules and it's American rules that will apply. Yes, last question. <laughs> when, when we make the big uh, positive step forward and as a country say, we want out, we're, we're done with NAFTA, goodbye, uh, you mentioned that six month time period and then what, then the negotiations start or is that during six months? For the end of six months, we say goodbye and we just want out. Well, okay, the question is how does it technically work around abrogation? The, the, I have, as the person on my board who is head of our policy, as a former diplomat who's, who's, who has signed and worked through many, many international agreements, energy agreements, the Great Lakes water agreements, so he tells me, and I trust him because he knows what he's talking about, that the way you do it diplomatically and legally is that you serve notice to the country that you are going to act, that you have the intention of abrogating. And if they say to you, well, what are you concerned about? Can we talk about how to change it? Then, there, then you can have negotiations. But you don't start off by saying, can we talk about it? You have to serve notice that you have the intention of, of abrogating. Now, I know it sounds like a technicality, but it's how the liberals are skating around this, so it's an important technicality. Because I don't believe they mean it. I mean, I've talked to Roy McLaren, and I know that their intention is 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 to actually increase free trade through through like they want Canada to be, to be a promoter of free trade through the world, no rules. So that's where that half of the Liberal Party is going. So it's very, it's, it, this is not just a technicality. Um, so we, we need a political party or parties to say to us that they would say to the Americans, we have the intention of advocating. And if they want to come to us and they're all upset and they want to negotiate, well, of course you talk to them. I, it won't happen in a hundred years. They're not going to give us back the stuff that's, I mean, the, the five points that I read to you, for instance, and there are many others, they're not going to give that back to us. So then you say, okay, well, we're setting it in motion and, and you serve notice and in six months it's canceled. It's, it's not very complicated, but it's it's the political will. It's not the legal will. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> oh, you're too late at night for me to answer about Cuba. I'm going to just tell you one funny story because you've been wonderful. And before I do, I'm going to ask you, please, if you if you agree with what you've heard tonight, please take memberships. Please, they're at the back. <laughs> they're being held up. Please give them to your friends, your family. We need support. We don't need a lot of money. We need lots of little bits of money. And we need lots of people helping out. <laughs> Thank uh -huh.